Flint and Feather is a system of miniature rules for wargaming, in particular for skirmish battles in the heroic age of Great Lakes First Nations. And you can use the rules to play individual games, just small confrontations, or you can also link them together in a campaign game for a more articulate narrative. So what we have here is a manual, it is professionally printed, it looks really nice, hardcover, glossy paper, nice illustrations, it does a really good job of explaining the game. And so, really high quality here from the point of view of the production. And once you have the rules, you are good to go. You can then use your own miniatures or you can purchase the miniatures that are provided or that have been designed for the game. This is a selection, this is a group of miniatures that the publisher sent me. And I didn't build them or paint them, I'm not particularly good at, but I have a friend who is. And so uh, I'll now be able to show you some of these miniatures, the detail and the quality when they are professionally assembled and given the finishing touches. My friend also, I'm gonna report the opinion of the experts, told me that these miniatures were easy and fun to build, fun to paint for those who are into such a thing. Again, not me. And he said that the miniatures come with a paint guide that really made it easier and, again, more pleasant to paint them. Definitely, if you put in the work, these miniatures contribute to the aesthetic appeal of the experience. But you know me, um, I don't mind playing with beautiful components as long as I don't have to uh, make them. Me, I'm more of a player than an artist, a painter, a builder, or whatever else. And so to play the game you will want to have more stuff on the board that you see here. You will want to create your own uh, landscape using terrain features. Then you will divide the miniatures into different groups. At the very least, you know, one player will have one, another player will have another. Then during the game, actually, groups also matter because they activate together. Miniatures that are in a group will activate more efficiently. In particular, a group is a group of miniatures that are within two inches from one another in any sort of configuration. This I, I don't have my measure tape here, but that's probably a group. And then we have other groups here. Now, uh, also you need to assign different values to your warriors. The miniature is the miniature, but you want to have a sheet of paper where you mark uh, what this miniature corresponds to. Warriors have a different level, let's call it experience level. They have a higher combat value if they're experienced, they have more abilities that they can use, they have more leadership, and so on and so forth. Combat value in this game also uh, doubles as, as life points. So when you take hits, uh, you lose combat value, and if you go down to zero exactly, the miniature is removed. If you go negative, the miniature is still removed, uh, the character dies, but also your group needs to take a nerve test because uh, they just saw that gory death. Also in this game, Low rolls are good. The test, a test when you're taking a nerd test or when you are trying to hit an opponent, the way it works is you roll a die and you're trying to roll equal to or lower than a certain result after modifiers. Now, the flow of the game, pretty interesting stuff. Uh, the players will alternate being the active player and the non-active player. The active player will get, to, will get to activate a number of groups from their forces and to perform an action with them. Then the non-active player will get to perform an action, which is a reaction, and then the active player will get to perform a second action. So basically in a turn is active player, reaction, active player again. And then you switch, and so now <clears throat> we have uh, active player, reaction, active player again. If you think about it, it simply means that players will alternate because just the way it is, but not all turns are equal because sometimes you'll take the reaction turns in which there are certain penalties. For example, when if you are uh, firing, it's assumed you're doing it in a rush, so there's less... Uh, uh, is less accurate, but still players basically will alternate, but the flow of the game is made a little more interesting, I believe, by, because of that. 
When you activate your forces, uh, uh, can you activate everybody? Who knows? First you need to look at this table. There's also a copy at the end of the rule book. I probably should look at that one because and that is a section where you have all the tables in one place. So it's much better to give you a sense of how the game works. So you look at the table that I showed you uh, that has different levels of morale. It can be standard, can be demoralized, can be inspired. And here we go. So you look at the end, all groups start uh, uh, with the standard morale. When you activate a, when you activate the beginning of your turn, when you add the active player, you roll a die, and looking at the, cor at the correct column, that tells you if you can activate everybody, all groups, or maybe only groups led by great warriors or companions, these are the highest levels, or only one group. So again, is in. So again, as you can see, if your characters are all scattered and you get to activate only some groups, then you don't get to activate everybody. If the characters are into fewer tight groups, even this result may allow you to activate everybody. Medicine roll pretty much means a random event and then you get to activate and, and you will draw random event cards from this deck here. So it's time finally to activate our warriors. We said they take actions, they take actions, and suppose then that I want to activate this group. Now it's my time to activate this group. And the figures can take different actions. Movement uh, is a very common one, of course. You can move, when you move, you can choose to walk, in which case you roll 2d6s and you take the highest result and that is how much you move in inches. Yes, movement is randomized. The idea is that all sorts of crazy stuff happens in the heat of battle, in terrain that maybe is unknown. And so that's, that's the way it is. When you, when you run, actually, you can also choose to run for movement, in which case you roll 3d6s and you take the two highest. But then also probably you want to know how you fight because that is such an important thing. So you will need a tape measure and you move, etc, etc, and then maybe the other group does something also. As for fighting, there is melee and there is ranged. I suppose and now we want to attack with range. It's a single die roll, pretty much you take the combat value of the figure that you are looking at and you apply modifiers based on the... If the target is an easy target, maybe you're shooting from the back or no, the target is concealed. So for example, behind a cover like bushes that will make it hard to see but not will not stop an arrow or cover, which is hard to see, and also uh, physical protection, so different things. And then you will simply roll and you determine if you hit or not. After that you take a damage roll in which has a modifier and the modifier comes uh, is based on, on distance. Say a bow will, uh, uh, will hit at a distance, a further distance, we'll go to 24 inches, but without uh, that much modifier if it hits, as opposed to a spear, shorter range, but it hits more heavily if it makes contact with a target. And then at the point, if you had it, uh, you, which uh, hitting usually is rolling equal to or lower than your combat value, roll here and you determine the damage that you have inflicted which can be gory death, can be things like that. And then he gets to combat, which is the other, to close combat, to melee, which is the other main action in the game. And it is, I will almost say, I don't know, half of the basic rules of the game have to do with combat. See comfortable, you know, put your feet up, it may take us a while. This is just the summary of how you resolve close combat. In a sense, it is the heart of the game. In a sense, it really is a game about positioning and trying to create the right situation in which you approach the opponent, you ambush them, and you launch a devastating melee attack, and after a long procedure to resolve it, you are the one that is still alive. Now, melee. First, suppose that this group is declaring a melee attack against this other, other against this other group. 
First we declare movement and we declare movement to be charging to combat, which is just movement, but we want to make contact with the opponent and thus we move, we roll, then we can make contact there. Then enemies in the enemy group that are still that are uh, within one inch of the of the mess can actually move also to make contact with the attacker. So now we have a number of figures that are locked together in combat. The attacker declares the, the, the attackers and the defender, well, will want to defend. What happens next is we select maneuvers. Players will use these two decks. The attacker will use the attacker deck and the defender, the defense deck. If you have a key character involved in the confrontation, then you will get to choose your attack or defense card. Otherwise, you get one randomly. And so these are pretty much the maneuvers that the attacker will want to choose from. And this one is just bad. Usually you don't choose it. It is just if you're randomly drawing, you may get the negative. Ugh, you just slit. Different uh, types of attack will work better, will cause more damage when using certain weapons, which gives, of course, the opponent certain uh, uh, things to think about. For example, if you are attacking me with a club, I think that maybe you will want to use Bash because it will give you more attack dice. So the opponent, either forced to draw randomly or choosing, will have a selected attack card and the defender will do the same. Uh, we're trying to figure out, again, there's a oof, but I'm trying to figure out what the opponent will do, the defender will select a defense card. At that point we reveal the cards and we look here, pretty much imagine this column here as being like a mini table. Bash versus duck. Bash versus duck gives three dice to the attacker and one to the defender and to show that I'm not making it up then we look at the card of the defender and we see that in fact Duck versus Bash gives three dice to the attacker and one to the defender. So that's, that's how it works. Now the defender and the attacker have a number of dice which can be modified by different things, say by the weapon, etc, etc. Then both attacker and defender decide how to allocate their dice. Each die can be, attack, can be used for attack or defense. With, within restrictions based on the card. For example, if you're bashing, all of your dice need to be used in attack. If you use other maneuvers, so say, if you use the cut or a jab, at least one die needs to be used in attack. But you could also choose to use the dice in defense. In a sense, it shows that you're attacking but not going all the way in. Still trying to pay attention to not getting hit. As opposed to here, you're just going. Duck, you have to use at least one die for defense, but you can use uh, other dice for for attack, in technically counterattack. So, for example, there's also a defense card, which is counter blow, zero, whatever given, just uh, attack as a defender. So now, defender and attacker have a have each has two piles, ideally or more or less, attack dice and defense dice. They both roll and pretty much you match the attack dies on one side against the defense die of the other side and vice versa. So the magic the gathering style when the characters, when creatures fight. Res lower results, lower than the combat value of the, of the main figure involved in the combat will be hits. Ones are super good hits and they cannot be stopped by normal by normal effective defenses of the opponent, they need to be stopped by ones. So each attack roll that is equal or lower than the combat value of the figure is a hit. Each defense roll equal to or lower than the combat value of the defending figure annuls a hit. So after that, there might or may not be a number of hits that have been allocated and then what happens then? Well, we finally allocate the hits. No, not necessarily. There will be still a die roll to decide exactly how uh, things shake up.
after we have all of the ones allocated, uh, we need to take a nerve test. We determine who the winning side is, and that would be the side that uh, inflicted the most hits. There will be modifiers but for the nerve test based on how many wounds have been caused, how many opponents fell down, and then you take pretty much the nerve point difference, say, based on people that fell down and wounds inflicted, the attacker quote-unquote generated two nerve points versus one nerve point generated by the defender, then the nerve test is a roll against the combat value of the involved figure. If uh, actually it was less than two, if it was two, is against the combat value of the figure minus one. If it is three to one, combat value of the figure minus two. So you inflicted three nerve points on me by inflicting once, and I only one on you. So I have to now take a test, and my com and my warrior has a combat value of of five for this test it counts as three and so that's I need to roll three or less to pass and if you don't pass depending on how you fail well feel free to pause and read this table it tells you what happens people running around opportunities for pursuit emerging so possibly that round of combat will generate other rounds of combat etc 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 I told you it was gonna be elaborate and complicated and that's the way it is that's the way it works it's a simple game when it comes to moving and shooting it becomes really tactical which is not a bad thing when it comes to resolving combat the game is scenario based so you can play a lot of different scenarios different missions with the game and you continue like this active player reactive player back and forth uh, oopsie until a player fulfilled the victory conditions of the scenario Flint and Feather is a really good miniature war game. I had such a good time playing it. And at the beginning, I was a little bit skeptical. I was afraid that uh, everything but combat was gonna be a little too straightforward, too simple, too basic. And then combat was gonna be uh, too much work for what it is. And mind you, I probably could skip one or two steps of combat. I don't need that I need to calculate odds and ratios just to see if there is a modifier of minus one of, or minus two on the nerve test. That part feels like I don't really need it. But this being said, the two elements of the design, the simple fluid movement mechanics, the intuitive mechanics for shooting, and then the epic moment that the melee battle is, they integrate well with one another much more. They, they, they just work well seamlessly because then you do have the time where you're uh, firing your arrows, you're throwing your spears, then the main confrontation starts, then you need to detach because it's not going so well and as you're running away and somebody's pursuing it, then you have having other volleys of of arrows and projectiles those elements go very well and since the battle the, the melee battle is such a big element then i don't mind that the turns in which you're just moving and maneuvering around or taunting each other there are also other actions that i didn't mention i want to give a sense of the main things the other actions that are much more linear then they give you a nice a nice break from the next big battle and yes it has many steps but there are interesting decisions there when it comes of course to deciding the maneuver bluffing because i know that you're attacking me that weapon so i know uh, that you know what the best weapon would be then should I defend accordingly, or I'm thinking that precisely because of that you're not using the obvious bash, you're using a counterintuitive uh, lunge or other types of maneuvers. I like that rock, paper, scissor element there. And then the fact that you can, under certain circumstances, decide how much you want to commit to an attack, how much you commit to defense. And that also, as a defender, you're not just standing there clueless. You may decide just to be brave or crazy sometimes the the line is difficult to draw and so instead of defending yourself you just 
launching a counterattack, committing to that entirely, which may be worthy because this is not a game that depicts a democracy. Oh no, the warriors are not all born equal. There are all sorts of advantages if you can destroy their great warrior that will affect their morale, that will affect their ability to uh, to activate. Um, and so, so the battlefield is not neutral. Uh, that qualitative element of the miniatures really comes into play because it changes the objectives, it changes the, the, the magnetic field of the battlefields. In certain areas will become more or less interesting. It causes you to maybe want to push your luck because then it really looks like it's a great opportunity to take down their great warrior unless it's a trap and you just fell for it. So there are just a lot of interesting things when it comes to the dynamics and the and the mechanics of the game. Don't be scared by the combat system because it's a lot more fluid than you would expect when you read the rulebook or maybe from my explanation. And then if you like the game, I just give you a sense of the skirmish core and actually just part of it. I mean, it's a long book. But then if you want to play as a campaign game, then you have so much stuff that you can use to create that rich, complex story world that your warriors can inhabit for a long time. Again, they can you can pretty much create their biography within a changing scenario. You can add other elements. If you want to have a fantasy element, then you can add supernatural creatures. You can have ma add magic. All those are options that are in the manual. In general, Flint and Feather is a very solid, very enjoyable miniature war game. If it wasn't for the combat system that can be a little daunting, maybe this could even be an introductory miniature war game. But you know what? I think it could be anyways. You just go through the motions, read the, the, the procedures a couple of times, and even if you're new to war gaming or miniature war gaming, you'll be able to figure it out, and I think you will have a good time. Because this is a game with a really nice and fun pace, constant back and forth, you're constantly engaged, stuff happens all the time. The battlefield is brimming with opportunities for interesting actions, for reactions, for interactions that will uh, will generate great gameplay. Feather, uh, Flint and Feather, Flint and Feather. The miniatures also look good. The ones that I saw cannot make claim credit for building them and painting them, but. If you are a builder and painter of miniatures, then again, you have great components here. As for the rules, which is what I'm most concerned, Flint and Feather. It's a really good game system, definitely enjoyable, really good.